Gospels, Luke chapter 23, we conclude today with a very powerful statement of the seven statements from Christ on the cross. I have um, reflected back as a, as a son. When I was a young man, I never thought about being a good son. It just never crossed my mind to be a good son. I just lived and survived and dealt with whatever was thrown my way, you know. And, and as I got older, I realized, you know, my dad was my dad. Uh, didn't matter his, his insecurities, his, his issues, the addictions he fought. Uh, my dad, of course, some of you are, know that my dad was, uh, didn't have a father coming up. And then as I got older, I found out that my biological dad lived less than a quarter mile from us and uh, never, ever recognized my dad as his son or us as his grandkids. And these are things we use this term quite often, a father's hurt. And I found that everybody that I have ever met be male or female, has a daddy hurt, has something that us dads, maybe we didn't mean to, maybe somehow, Kenny, we just, we were uh, apathetic in it, you know, just didn't know that they were hurt or needed us at a time. I know in my life, my greatest joys have been my kids and my greatest disappointments has been me as a father. And I look at the relationship between Jesus and his father and realize there has only been one perfect father-son relationship, and that was Christ Jesus and the father. And I look at that, and I say, God, help me, because it's not too late as a man to be a better man. This ain't a Father's Day message, but boy, it would work. Amen. It would preach. Are you comfortable? I was till you started talking like that. Albert, good to see you. Amen. Luke is the only one. If you, if you just read Matthew, Mark, and John, you'd miss this statement. You'd say that there was only six statements that Jesus made from the cross. But Luke the doctor picked up on his last words, the very last words that he said. And it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. Every word tells us something important. Father, that word, this was Jesus' favorite title for God. Amen. And of course, at the beginning of the cross, Father, forgive them. At his last words on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He booked in everything that happened on those six hours. Even, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus dies with the knowledge that the price has been fully paid. The cup is now emptied. The burden has been borne. Estrangement from God's people is now over. Jesus yields his life to the one he called Father, releasing his right to life. I said this week at a funeral of a friend of mine named Johnny Clark, who was 59 years old, died of a heart attack. Love Johnny. I said to his family that Johnny has left the land of the dying to go to the land of the living. Many of us, we got it what my dad would call bass ackards. We think we in the land of the living, and then we die. That's not true. We in the land of the dying. We all dying. But we're going to the land of the living. Amen. Amen. I can't say what I just said in the next service. They'd get offended. But y'all can handle what I just said. Every now and then my dad pops up out of my mouth. Y'all ever had that problem? I'll quit now. Father, I love you. Thank you for the word of God. Help me just to share, God, just the truth of it in Jesus' name. And everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you, maybe. The cup emptied. Man, all the suffering, everything they gone through, the beatings, everything, uh, the, the betrayal, uh, the desertions, all of it, the cup was empty. Now, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. For 12 hours he had been in the hands. Listen to me. We sung this song about hands a while ago. Uh, I, I was trying to remember it again. Then we jumped on the next song, and I forgot the second song. 
But I saw hands in that first song. And I thought about those hands. He'd been in the hands of wicked men. With their hands, they beat him. With their hands, they slapped him. With their hands, they abused him. With their hands, they crowned him with thorns. With their hands, they ripped out his beard. With their hands, they smashed him black and blue. With their hands, they whipped his back until it was torn to bits. With their hands, they beat nails into his hands and into his feet. With their hands, they pierced his side. Their hands had had their way with him. But now, it's all shifted. I love the word hand in the word of God. The Bible tells me that my times are in his hands. Amen. I only have, you know, not just, you know, we think of time, we think 24 hours. But anybody ever had a good time? I have. Those good times were in his hands. Amen. God put us in his hands. And I've often said, I remember back in the day, Tommy, that, that, uh, it was a um, it was an oil commercial, and they 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 would grab a screwdriver and hold the end of it. Anybody remember that? And I think it was STP, and 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 they would hold that oil in that, and it, and it would slip through you. It, they could grip it, but if they dipped it into STP and you held the end of the screwdriver, it just slide right through your hand. Amen. Which really means he, well, let me just say it like this: his grip don't slip. A while ago, I walked around this building with Joshua. Joshua Dean grabbed my hand. And as he grabbed my hand, I had to shake hands left-handed all the way around. The he's he's politicking. He running for pastoral, I guess. I don't know. But he, he shook everybody's hand in the building. But I never let go of his hand all the way around the building. He didn't have my hand. I had his hand. And as long as you keep your hand in the hand. Oh, come on, Jesus. Put your hand in the hand of the man that calmed the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man that calmed the sea. Put your hand in the hand, and I forgot the rest of the song about the man from Galilee. But it just came over me right then. How many remember that old song? Woo, man, that's an oldie there. That oldie but goodie. But I'm telling you, you got to put your hand in his hand. Amen. Because his grip, it don't slip. Hallelujah. So here at this moment, Jesus turned to the Father. He said, I commit to you. I commit my spirit. The word means to deposit something valuable in a safe place. You've got something valuable in you. Amen. You know, that second, third song, it tells of value. Uh, we all have value. When you treat people with value, you give them dignity. And it's important that everybody here has value. Amen. Everybody here. So Jesus took that which was valuable to him, his spirit, and he placed it into a safe deposit box called the hand of God. It was his most valuable possession. His body wasn't his. You know, listen, we treat our bodies as if they are our most valuable possession. We operate on them. We exercise them. We feed them. We wash them. We look. But this spirit inside of you. Amen. You are body, soul, that's not your mind, your intellect, and spirit. There's a spirit that can only be fed through worship and the Word. Amen. That spirit, many times we come to church and your spirit, amen, has shriveled up like a raisin. Hallelujah. It's been sitting out in the sun. It's been hurting. It's been neglected. It ain't heard no word. It ain't heard no gospel. Amen. It ain't been kind to nobody. He's shriveled up. And you get here, and all of a sudden your spirit begins to cry out, Help me! Help me! And you begin to worship, and as you it don't take long for your spirit to begin to grow again. Hallelujah! And jump right, and all of a sudden now you are body, soul, and spirit. Woo, you done growed up some. That's what church does for me. Amen. To be back around the believers of Christ, my spirit begins to grow. And Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit not my body. I've already turned my mama over to, to John. So only thing I got left is my spirit. Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm giving it to you. I think that's a powerful statement for every one of us to say. Let's say it together. Lord, in your hands, I commit my spirit. See, I'm not worried about your body. Your body's going back to the same place it came from. Amen. Your body's nothing but worm food. Can I get an amen? That's all it is. Amen. It just goes right back in, and we just start it all over again. But your spirit, amen, who you are. You're, everything about you, and by the way, your personality is connected to that. God gave you that. Hallelujah. So your spirit, you commit to him. And then my spirit, by that phrase, Jesus meant his very life, his personal existence. Father, I can no longer care for myself. 
And I'm placing myself in, you know, before I could walk on the water and it wouldn't drown me. I could walk to the top of the mountains and I wouldn't be exhausted. I could go 40 days without food and, and I would be fine. Amen. I could fight that devil off. Hallelujah. And I was good. I have done everything. I have healed lepers. I have put eyesight back in people. I've helped them here again. I've done everything you've asked me to do. I came here with an intention to be a good son. And I've been a good son. Now here at the end of my life, I say, Father, I commit my spirit. I'm giving it over to you. I can't do anything else with this thing. Amen. It's over with. I've given you 33 years of the best days of my life. Amen. So I'm releasing. And here's a powerful word, relinquishing. See, a lot of times we don't relinquish. We don't let go. Somebody passes, we hang on. And, you know, I'm an animal lover. I will call my dog Coda Max all the time, which tells me I ain't quite let that dog go yet. I, I, I drive around out there, and I see these giant boots on the property, and I drive around them boots. Max's bones are under them boots. It's hard to relinquish. How many understand that? It's hard to let it go. Sometimes letting a... a a material thing goes not a hard thing. A house, a vehicle, but something that has loved you back is hard to let go of. And at that moment, Jesus said, I'm releasing, I'm relinquishing everything that I've got left here, and I'm putting it in your hands. I'm going to give that over to you. It's prophetic, Psalm 31, 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me. Buy me back. Buy me back, amen, to redeem, amen, oh, Lord, the, the God of truth. You know, I've always loved telling this little story of the little boy that built a little sailboat, made it out of wood, carved it out, put SS boy on the side of it, amen, loved it, put it in the stream. And during a hard rain, that boat took off, and he lost his little boat. I got the sniffles, been mowing a lot of grass, and, uh, Sometimes you can use that like it's the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? You can get, pop a tear or sniff a little, and it looks like he's really, he's really preaching. No, I'm struggling. Uh, that ship went down to sea, and the little boy was walking through town, and he looked in the window of a pawn shop, and there was SS little boy sitting there. His little boat had to sail on it. He ran inside that store and said, Sir, you got my boat in your window. He said, uh-huh. He said, I want my little boat back. He said, you can't have it back. He meant you got to buy it. He meant, but it's my boat. I built the boat. I made the, I put the sail on it. That pencil, that little number two pencil holding up that sail, I put that on there, stole it out of the schoolroom. He meant, that's my, that's my boat. I called the SS boy on the side of it. But, boy, you can't have it. You got to buy it. So the little boy went on, <clears throat> broke up in his piggy bank. Started counting out his money and realized to the penny, everything he had, everything he owned, he counted, and that's all the money I got left. But I love that boat. So he took his money, and he went back to the pawn shop, and he put all that change up there. He said, sir, I'm going to buy that little boat in the window. He, man, the man gave him the boat. He took the money. The little boy walked out, took that little boat, and held it in his precious hands, held it up before heaven. He said, I made you, and I bought you. Now you're twice mine. Did you know God made you, and he bought you? You twice his. Amen. Stick with the Father. Can I get it? Come on, give him praise in this house. His physical sufferings have now reached a climax. The pain now is unbearable. Breathing is almost impossible. The crowds gather around like vultures circling. His friends, the friends of Jesus, they watch in horror as his life begins to ebb away. That rattles in his throat. And somewhere down below, the Bible says he with a loud voice, everything he had inside of him. Amen. The angels are looking away. The Son of God is about to die. Death by crucifixion was in every sense of the word excruciating. It is a perfectly chosen word because excruciating comes from the Latin word excrucius, which literally means out of the cross. When you say excruciating, you simply are saying, I feel like I've been crucified. Amen. It's excruciating heat. Next 10 days, high 90s, dry as it can be. It's going to be excruciating. You're going to feel like out of the cross that you walk out of this building and feel that. He voluntarily gave up his life. He released it. Amen. Look here in John chapter 10 verse 17. The reason my father loves me. Let me tell you why daddy loves me. Is that I laid down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Now stop, 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 stop right there. Look here. He said this in John chapter 10. 
He, he, it's, it's, it's months before he's crucified. But he said, I lay down my life and I take it up again. You know what he was doing? He gave a hint. Hello. If you ever had a hard time taking a hint, come on. I had a house full of people Sunday night. Bishop Bob Woods was there, his wife Terry. My family came over. Josiah and Natalia were there. And we're talking about going to go see that Top Gun show on Monday night. Natalia and Maris, they hadn't seen it yet. They ain't seen the first. Oh, it's so loud in my house. Y'all got that? The, the newest thing because of them Gaines people over in Waco, that fixer-upper stuff, is that open concept. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Everybody tearing out walls, and it's just one great big open concept. You can't even hide behind the wall anymore. Amen. It's open concept. That, that looks good, but it sounds awful when you get four women around the kitchen bar and you're trying to watch TV, Ken. Oh, Lord Jesus. So I'm sitting there with Pastor Bob, and I'm not putting the ladies down. I'm just saying the volume. You ever heard somebody say, use your inside voice? It don't work at my house. The, the volume knob's broke. And it got louder, Joseph, and louder. And finally, being a man that could take a little control, Josiah and Natalia hadn't seen the original Top Gun, so I kicked it on. Netflix. And all of a sudden, I started raising that volume. And I raised that volume up to about 100%. And all of a sudden, Everything got quiet in the house, and the girls pulled up chairs, and Pastor Bob looked over at me and gave me a little wink. Without starting World War III, we got something done. Amen. In other words, it was a little hint. Shh. Y'all hear me? Jesus gave a little hint. He said, I lay down my life, and I take it up again. What's he talking about? Getting up in the morning? What are you talking about? The disciples never quite picked up on it. Amen of the resurrection. And, he, and then Jesus said, this command I received from my father. So before I left heaven, my father told me that I'm going to have to lay down my life, but it's going to be all right. I get to raise it up again. Amen. I will be crucified. I will die for the earth, for everybody that walks on the earth, but he going to let me rise up again. Amen. That was the commending that went on at that moment. It perfectly harmonizes the gospel account of the death of Christ in Matthew, which tells us Jesus dismissed his spirit. Amen. He said to his spirit, you can go. It's a military term. You're dismissed. Amen. And then you go on with your duty. He dismissed his spirit. He told his spirit it was all right. When Jesus Jesus had cried out again with a loud voice, Matthew 27, 50. He gave up his spirit. For all this, we know that he knew it was time to die. He wasn't afraid to die. He died with his life complete. With our anger, bitterness, he died in complete control of his senses and circumstances. And he died knowing where he was going, back to the Father's hand. There's nothing like the peace you got at night, laying down your head, knowing you're going to be with the Father. There's nothing like me getting being able to do a memorial or funeral knowing that the saints that love God are going to be with him, leaving the land of the dying and going to the land of the living. Can I get an amen? He faced death, amen, as a model of how faithful should face it. They're not afraid. They're not filled with remorse over wasted opportunities. They've endured their portion of grace knowing that a better day waits on the other side of the great divide. If they suffer, they hold fast. They endure to the promises of God. They do not, uh, they, they do Nothing to hasten the moment. They're going to make it happen. But when it finally comes, they have courage to face it, for they've committed themselves completely into their Father's hands. Father! Whew, what? No longer God. Father! Dad! The voice that called forth the dead, the voice that taught the will, and the voice that screamed at God now says, Father, the two are one again. The abandoned is now found. The schism between heaven and earth is now bridged. Father! He smiles weakly. It's over. Satan's vultures have been scattered. Hell's demons have been jailed. Death has been damned. The sun is out. I'm telling you, it's over. An angel sighs, and a star wipes away a tear. Take me home. 
That's literally what he's saying. Take me home. Yeah, take me home. Take, take this prince to his king. Take the son to his father. Take the pilgrim to his home. Take me home. Come, 10,000 angels. Come and take this wounded troubadour to the cradle of his father's arms. Farewell, old manger. Bless your holy ambassador. Go home, death slayer. Rest well, sweet soldier. The battle is over. Amen. Joseph. Hebrews tells us this in chapter 2, verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, that's us, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Let me read that to you out of the message. Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by his death. By embracing death, taking it into himself, absorbing it, he destroyed the devil's hold on it and freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. I've often said, guys, the angels look at all of us and scratch their halo. They try to figure out why we keep getting second, third, and fourth chances. Amen. The power is in the blood, the redemptiveness of God over our lives. Angels don't get that. So they look at our lives, and, and they can't figure that out. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. And when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where there was needed. When I go to this thought here, it talks about that Satan, the devil, holds the power of death. And I know you've heard me preach and others say that Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He did. But you still need to understand this thought. That as long as there's a devil, there's going to be death. And when he is barred and cast into the lake of fire. See, hell, people say hell all the time. You hear it in comedy and, and slang words and hell. We talk about hell, this place of heat and hot and, and uh, where the worm dies not. But the Bible says that hell is going to be cast into a lake of fire. So hell's like a holding place before all this is over. And then when it's over, hell, Satan, and the demons will all be cast into a lake of fire. So it's a, it's a powerful understanding that hell ain't the ending. But it's just a thought that Satan holds the power. And when he's no more, death will be no more. So between now and then, Satan still rules the realm of death. Men fear death, and for good reason. They're entering into a realm Satan controls. But the death of Jesus Christ spoiled his power. As long as men stay dead, death was Satan's ultimate tool to keep men in chains. But one man changed all that. He died, but he didn't stay dead. He broke Satan's power when he tore off the bars of death. Do you remember Carmen? Do you remember Carmen? Do you remember Carmen? I, I knew Carmen. And Carmen had all kinds. Of, come out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Amen. Tremendous singer. But many years ago, guys, if I can bring you back in my life, even back to my previous church, we, had a, we did a theme uh, in a... In a an arena over in Crosby here, a Cowboy Sunday. And my son, Josiah, who is now 29 years old, was about six or seven then. And he had a set of six shooters on him. And we did the song by Carmen. Where it was almost like a rocky fight between Jesus and the devil. And in that fight, Satan takes a hit and hits Jesus and knocks him down the cross. He looks like he's dead. And all of a sudden, the referee starts counting. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. And the devil stops the referee and says, hold on. You're counting backwards. Five. Four. No, 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 no. You're, you're counting backwards, man. You got to count four. You can't count. Three. Two. And when he says one, 
Jesus comes up off the mat and beats that devil down. He forgot the resurrection and what God had planned for his son. Amen. As we pass beyond the curtain, we're going to live on and on. But it will not be as it is today, not with a halting limp or a wrinkled brow, not with dimming eyes or faltering steps, not with twisted spine or runaway tumors, not with bitter memories and faded dreams, not with amputated legs or injured hearts. No, not with all these. We're going to be clothed. Not with this mortal flesh, amen, but something God made. He's going to bring us up just like he did him. So in closing, I say again, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. If you keep reading what Luke said, at the sixth hour the sun stopped, and he said, Father's into your hands. Then he had said this, he breathed his last, verse 47, the centurion, the Roman soldier, seeing what had happened, praised God. And said, surely this man was a righteous man. Verse 48, then all the people who gathered to witness this sight saw what had took place. They beat their breasts and went away. Heads bowed for a moment. We're here to say thank you again, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for taking our sin. Thank you for taking our place. Thank you for being a faithful son. Thank you for loving the Father enough to complete a myth. Oh, we get so distracted here. We're distracted with this and that and, and all the things that lay before us. But help us to be better sons and daughters. Help us to complete our race on this planet. Realizing we're leaving the land of the dying. And we're heading to the land of the living. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, come on, give God praise. We're sitting down, but give him praise. Can, can I encourage you to get hungry after God? You know, the Bible says God feels those that are hungry. Many times we don't, we may have it, but we ain't recognized it yet. Possess the gifts of the Spirit. The presence of God, but it's hunger that changes our life. And when we hunger after God, He'll fill you. You know, I'm a, I got filled with the Holy Ghost when I was 19 years old. Filled with the Holy Ghost. I wasn't in church. I was in a majorette's house. Her name Belinda. Little Baptist girl got born again. Still serving God. I was in there with Bubba and Randy. And we praying one night, just hungry. That's what I love about camp. Camp's about hunger, man. And when you're hungry after God, just, I just, I want to, you know, I want to be healed. But you keep going and keep doing this and that. But to be hungry after God, to press into Him until you are healed. Amen. We're hearing a lot of this term, mental illness today. I have never met anybody that didn't have a little touch of mental illness. Everybody I know got some kind of blip. Me too. Amen. I skip. Brain skips like a record. I know some of y'all don't know what records are, but what they, back in the day, skip like a record. Hung up. Man, but to stay with God, He's the great provider. He's the great healer. He, he's the great filler. And if I stay after God, and, I pray, and I'm hungry for Him, not just church on Sunday, but through the week to seek after Him, watch what God does. You know, I'm, I'm in that prayer meeting. Next thing I know, it's just four of us on a prayer meeting night. We're just going to pray. I'll never forget as long as God, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. I have been with Church of Christ, and they told me God don't do that no more. I've been with Baptists said God don't do that no more. I, I've been with people that said God don't do that no more. Forgive. Then what happened that night? I'm 19 years old. I'm sitting in a in a meeting with Belinda, Bubba, and Randy. We just young teenage out of high school. All of us just got born again. We don't know. We don't know the Bible, and we start praying. 
God, whatever you got for us, give it to us. We ain't got no money. We drive old, ugly cars. You know, like 72 Chargers and 70 Malibus, 69 Novas, Mark 1s, them ugly cars. That's what we all drove. Randy had a Supreme. It was one of the nicer Dodges. We all drove ugly cars. We sat inside the Mach 1. Oh, I love the Mach 1. I'm praying. I got to get up. I got to be on an RC Cola truck at 6 a.m. We praying. Woo, Father, we love you. I don't know what you just did in my life, but you changed it. My mom and dad think I'm crazy. All my old friends think that I, I've lost my mind. I got a mental illness that can't be healed. And all of a sudden, in that room came the glory. Four teenagers on their knees. We didn't even know the scripture says, don't let your good be spoken evil of. We didn't know nothing about that. Three boys in a girl's house. We were just praying. All of a sudden, I opened my eyes. That little Baptist girl got her hands up in the air and her lips are stammering. I'm speaking in another tongue, man. I never heard that tongue before. It scared me. But he's feeling me. All night, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, we prophesying over one another what the Lord going to do in our lives. All of us became preachers. All our lives were turned around. Randy and Bubba ended up in the same college as I did in San Antonio, leaving from Alabama to go there. Bubba marries a young lady, has a child, both of them killed by a drunk driver, buried together in the same coffin. But he persevered. Met another young lady, had a family, life goes on. Randy, Randy's still pressing on for Jesus, been here in this church. Belinda, a songwriter, knows the man that you hear the song every morning that starts his service, Lenny LeBlanc. All those connections started out of a prayer meeting. You don't know what's going to happen Tuesday night. I'm just saying stay hungry. Everything don't happen at an altar. Sometimes it happens in your living room, in your car, in a bubble bath. You don't know what's going to happen. Can I get an amen? amen? If you need to tie the offering envelope, it's right in front of you. Hopefully you've done made it. And listen, if you want to sponsor or bless any of our children that are going, we hadn't done this yet. But I've already started sponsoring kids that are coming to camp. It's $100 for the kids. So let's deal with the kids right now. If you want to add an extra 100 we got kids that are going. We just said, hey, come on. We ain't asked about the money. You just come on. Our church always takes care of them. So if you would like to give a little more, amen, to help our kids go to kids camp. Because we got them. This is, <laughs> there has never been a camp this least expensive for a kid to go for three days, two nights, and nine meals. It don't happen. You can't get your babysitter to pull that off. Amen. So reach, get your envelope. I get our servant leaders to come up. Whew. Memory lane, memory lane, memory lane. Woo, God's good. Amen. Oh, he's good. He's good, 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 good. Man, good crowd today. Thanks for coming out. First of June, it's already here. The year is moving on. I'm in no hurry for it to end. Amen. The older I get, I just kind of want to just hang out in a year. You know, kind of hang out a little bit, a little bit more. As we give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom of God. Amen. Y'all give Pastor David a hand as he comes. Amen. 10 o'clock this week, you'll come join us Monday through Thursday, 10 o'clock at the ropes course. And pray for Pastor David, man. A lot of them camps, they get his phone number and they wear him out. Have you ever counted how many air conditioners we got? I'm going to say on that whole camp, we got about 30 air conditioners. 30 air conditioners. Y'all struggling with one? 30. And if one goes out, that side of that cabin will call him. And if they can't get hold of him, they need his number. Can't get, they're going to get my number because we're all there. Amen. But thank God for AC men. Amen.
Somebody going to show up. Sam Campbell's our AC man now, and uh, Sam's connected to this house, old friend of mine, so thank God he showed up. Amen.